Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and I'm here with Meher Roy. And today we're speaking with Joel Thorstensen, who is the technical co-founder of Three Box Labs, um, the creator of Ceramic. And Ceramic is this uh, data storage solution um, for um, Web3 projects. And we'll talk about this um, in just a little bit. Um, but just before, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor this week. Our sponsor this week is Omni. Omni is your new favorite multi-chain uh, mobile wallet. Omni supports more than 25 protocols, so you can manage all of your assets in one place. But what's really special about Omni is what you can do inside the wallet. Want to get yield? Omni allows you to get the best APY with zero fees and three taps need to swap. Omni aggregates all major bridges and DEXs, so you can bridge and swap across all supported networks in one transaction directly in your wallet. Love NFTs? Omni offers the broadest NFT support of any wallet, so you can collect and manage your favorite NFTs across all chains in one place. Omni truly is the easiest way to use Web3, and it's fully self-custodial, meaning you never have to trust anyone with your assets other than yourself. And they support Ledger as well. Give Omni a try at omni.app. Joel, it's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, thanks. Great to be here. I remember you from ages ago at Consensus, so clearly you've been in the ecosystem a while. <laughs> T tell us what you've been up to. Yeah. Um, well, it started, I was playing around with Ethereum before the launch in like 2015, did a bachelor project that led to an internship at Consensus. Um, and eventually started working part-time at Consensus uh, as I was finishing my master's in uh, complex adaptive systems. Um, and so at the time, the project I was working at at Consensus is called Uport. So this was this early identity-focused project um, in the Ethereum ecosystem. So some of the older listeners might remember that. Um, and at Uport, that's essentially where I met my co-founders. And we started actually incubating inside of Uport uh, what eventually has become Ceramic Network. Right. So how did you come up with the idea of Ceramic? Or rather, what is the grand idea behind Ceramic? Yeah, so one thing that we noticed with Uport was that we're building this identity solution and uh, we kind of had to build our own wallet. And even back in like 2016, 2017, it felt like it doesn't seem right to compete with MetaMask and all of the other wallets that were was around at the time. Um, and so one of the inquiries that led to the creation of our first prototype called 3box.js uh, was essentially like, hey, can we build a system that allows, allows developers to build more data-rich applications, um, but it works with any wallet? And so we we're prototyping on that, and that led to this 3box.js SDK. And after like that having been used by a bunch of people over time, uh, we draw some main insights from that experience and, and created uh, Ceramic. Thinking back a while ago, the first thing that I kind of um, became aware of under the three box umbrella was this chat box. And we actually, at the time, we kind of integrated it into um, um, a prediction market platform that we were offering at the time. I mean, still around, you can still use them, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, and basically it was just a way to kind of put comments and stuff. Um, so how, how did you get from there to, you know, this very comprehensive data storage solution? The JavaScript SDK that we're building was very ambitious. We're trying to build this completely decentralized in-browser um, system that would allow you to make some basic social features like comments and profiles and things like this um, and have that be live inside of your browser. So that was using a JavaScript implementation of um, IPFS at the time. Um, and some of the learnings we got from that is that uh, these kind of data structures that enable this really local first type of applications uh, are really powerful primitives. Uh, and they are, have similarities to blockchains in that you have these verifiable data structures um, that can be shared across multiple nodes. 
but uh, doing actually doing it and starting to build that in browser first is really difficult. Um, and so we took the core insights of like these data structures, how we can deal with identities and how we can create, um, basically use updates and events users create over time to create a, an actual database and uh, take this and build a, a, a node application that your um, front end applications can talk to. So in the same way you would talk to like an Ethereum node, you can also talk to uh, a ceramic node that could deal with more of like the data rich features. I was going through all the ceramic uh, ceramic documentation on the on the web today, and maybe I'll tell you my imagination of how like why you need something like ceramic or how this idea comes about, and maybe you could corroborate if if I understand it right. So to me, the story really starts with. Just, just the observation that, you know, the fact that, you know, I have data on Ethereum, and then I can use multiple front ends or multiple user interfaces for, for my accounts, yeah, is really cool. Um, and you always start to wonder, why doesn't like the entire internet stack work that way? Meaning, um, you start to wonder, okay. Why doesn't social media work that way? I can put my data onto Facebook and then I can use some other user interface to Facebook. And this is a, like this is like a, quite a standard thought experiment many of us have done. And there are many projects that go down in this direction. So I think one of the things that one starts to realize when you want this kind of composability that like there, there should be multiple user interfaces to some data I have is you don't really need blockchains or consensus all the time, right? So if you have financial data, that data should lie on Ethereum. Or if you have a DAO, that financial logic should lie on Ethereum. But if it's my personal data, uh, that I want to put somewhere and allow lots of people to build applications, then my personal data may not need the blockchain at, at all. And I necessarily don't want to pay the cost of the blockchain consensus at all. So start to need some kind of data layer um, where I can put, I can push my data and, and then other people can build applications on, on top of top of that. Um, so that's kind of like the direction ceramic goes down, uh, goes toward, but what ceramic is kind of also adding is the observation that for, for good interoperability to exist among multiple applications, we need, you know, standard ways of doing identity, standard ways of doing profiles, standard ways of doing X, like all of these news feeds and things like that and you're allowing for such standards to to exist so is that right uh, is it is like a data it's a data layer that ena enables people to build uis for these uis to be on interoperable with each other yeah i think that that's a good overview i, I think there's a few things there I, I could double click on so first of all like the the financial aspect of blockchains uh, blockchains are hard to scale because we have this requirement of um, what in distributed systems is called strong consistency. That means that basically all nodes in the network need to be able to uh, have an agreement uh, all the time, like what the state of the system is. And this is how we prevent double spends. And in a system that doesn't deal with any kind of asset, but it's more just data that's produced by the user, uh, we can uh, kind of loosen that constraint uh, because we're fine with uh, what is called eventual consistency. Um, and so we don't need to always have all the nodes have the same agreement on, on what the state of the system is. Uh, and the nice thing is that we can also have different nodes only synchronize different aspects of the network. Uh, so you might care only about a subset of users or a subset of data models in the network. Um, and this is really uh, what we uh, achieve with ceramic. 
Yeah, and then the second point around like standards and things like this. Um, I think that's something that is really tricky, and and our approach to it has been to like uh, provide examples, but we don't want to like set the standards, right? We want the community to come up with the things that works for their applications, because ultimately, like we are not gonna be able to know what different applications needs. Um, and so the approach we take to it uh, in in our graph database product, which we're building on top of Ceramic, um, uh, called ComposeDB, is that developers can come and create data models. They can onboard their users and have their users write data to these data models. Uh, and then other developers can import these data models into their applications and kind of get the onboarding of those users for free because the data is already there. So that's the composability that you were talking about. I, I have lots of questions for kind of these for for lots of lots of different facets here, but kind of I think I want to step back and kind of look at the larger landscape of um, data solutions in the Web three space first. So I think um, our listeners may be familiar with products such as Arweave and IPFS and Sire, and so how would you kind of um, contextualize ceramic within that landscape. How is it different or similar to those? So, yeah, all of the the three products you mentioned, they have focused first on just like how can we store files and how can we store like pieces, chunks of data, in an efficient way that can scale. Um, and those are all very useful things to have um, in the ecosystem, like. Storage of massive amount of data is is incredibly important. Uh, our focus from the start has been on users, their identity, and like how to make these systems easy to use for people. Um, so in ceramic, instead of having creating blocks where you either have deals with miners to store data, or you have big blocks that include a bunch of data, as in um, some of these systems do. Uh, we just let we don't really have blocks in ceramic. We we rely on the security of Ethereum, and instead each user creates an event stream of actions they take in the network. This event stream you can think of kind of like a micro ledger that is signed by the user's key, and all of these updates we can verify that they come from the user. Um, and since we have like all of it, like if we take that together. Um, we can have a view of multiple users with all their independent event streams, uh, and we can compose that into a database view. Uh, so it's like a different approach to to the architecture. But but does that mean that basically only the event creator can write to the event stream? Because basically, if different people have like write permissions, this won't work, right? Yeah. So in Ceramic right now, uh, each event stream has a controller which is essentially um, a, a user account. Uh, so right now there's support for, I think, three different uh, blockchain wallets. Uh, most users use Ethereum, uh, Ethereum-based wallets. And so every event stream is controlled by one account, uh, but then you can take multiple event streams and listen to all these events and create a, a combined view of that. Okay, so say um, one of the event streams is, say, my Twitter output. So things I tweet, but also things I like and things I retweet and so on. Um, you could just kind of, this would kind of fit the, uh, I don't know whether broader social media um, data structure or Twitter data structure, and then it can be compared to other people's data structures and can be compiled into a view of, a decentralized version of Twitter, where basically I can say how I wanna how I wanna view things, or which things I wanna prioritize, or which things I wanna be shown. Because basically, the way that social media works right now is that, I mean, obviously there's you know uh, very uh, complex algorithms at work to kind of calculate what to show you, but what exactly they do and how they operate and what they prioritize. This is this is not visible and there's no competition as to this. So basically would, would kind of ceramic enable um, other people to kind of build on the same data streams and 
um, kind of showcase this differently or prioritize things differently? The, the, the power of ceramic in this case is that we can actually start to mimic a little bit more how the architecture of kind of Web2 social media works because uh, Web2 social media networks like Twitter or Facebook, they don't scale on a strong consistency model like a blockchain. They have, um, they have some databases, they have event streams in their systems, and they have a bunch of microservices that take care of different tasks. Uh, so we can imagine a very primitive social network on Ceramic that is like, oh, here's my, my tweets. And then when I follow um, Frederike and Mayer, I just compose that into my view. Uh, but if I follow like uh, thousands of people, that's not really going to be efficient. Uh, but the cool thing with Ceramic is that they could actually be a service somewhere that ingests all of these streams of my followers as a, and, and as a microservice runs some computation over it and outputs that in a new event stream. Uh, and then I consume that. And this computation uh, could be done in a verifiable manner. Uh, either it's a deterministic computation that I can rerun and see that it was correct. Uh, or uh, maybe in the future, if we can have like very efficient CKPs, like that could even be that. But for, for the time being, like having a uh, compute uh, actually attributed by in the ceramic stream by the, this micros microservice provider actually gives us some better um, trust in the system. And I can actually choose which of these service providers that I want to build my um, my stream of, of tweets or, or what have you. Okay. I think one thing that I kind of don't understand yet um, is, I mean, you do distinguish between different kinds of consensus, um, but why do you need um, consensus in the ceramic network at all? I mean, if it's just a decentralized storage layer, and it can be proven that basically my data is stored. Why does it need consensus? Well, so we need some some basic form of consensus, right? Like if if your node and my node get the exact same events, we want to be sure that we end up in the same state. Right? If we don't end up in the same state, uh, that's bad. So it's not like a, a global consensus that uh, in the in the sense of blockchains where there is an agreed upon state that everyone in the network agrees on. It's more like if we consume the same events, we end up at the same state. So it okay, would be so terrible. Okay, so it's more like a checksum. Yeah, not like a group in, in, in distributed okay. systems, this is called consensus, like that, that your nodes can actually arrive at the same conclusion. Uh, okay, I think then then I just have a very different mental representation of consensus because to me consensus kind of is a is, is by default a global thing, but I think this is maybe just a, a corruption of kind of how the actual technical term is used by um, unlearned communities. Okay, so that, then I kind of then then I kind of understand that part. You said that you guys build on Ethereum, so basically, what's kind of the connection between Ceramic and Ethereum? Yeah, so. I mentioned these event streams that are signed by end users. Um, so they're good for like, okay, now we know we have attribution to who, who created what and who wrote what into the network. Uh, but we also want some, some guarantees about when certain events took place. And this is where Ethereum comes into the picture. So uh, every once in a while, uh, event streams are anchored into the blockchain. And what this means is that there is a hash or some other kind of vector commitment that's included in, in the blockchain um, that basically uh, allows any consumer of this event stream to um, convince themselves that, okay, this event was published at least at this point in time. Um, and obviously like making one uh, Ethereum transaction uh, per event stream update would not really be scalable. Uh, so what we do is, is uh, we create a Merkle tree uh, that batches a bunch of updates to a bunch of different streams and puts the root of that um, Merkle tree on chain. So earlier you mentioned that data in Ceramic will be eventually consistent, which, ki which kind of means that if, if let's say I push two updates, um, so let's say I, I'm using the Ceramic Twitter and I push two posts 
and one after the other. Ultimately, the ceramic network will decide on which post came first and which came second, right? And there might be a span of time where the network hasn't made made a decision, but ultimately it will uh, eventually it will make make this decision. That's how I think of eventual consistency. Yeah, and in the case of your personal posts, you actually when you make post one and then you make post two, your post two will actually point back to your previous post. So like for your personal things, it will be like ordered, uh, but between like two different users, it's not ordered in the same way. And then we would rely on these anchors. Okay, so how, how do you reach eventual consistency in, in the network? Is it, is, it down to, is it down to the the anchor in the Ethereum blockchain, meaning like some ceramic node at some point of time is going to put, push an anchor and then whatever ordering they did is the ordering of the ceramic network. Is it like that or is there a different mechanism? Yeah, so based on the anchor, uh, you can look at the blockchain and see like, hey, that's this block that was produced, what's the block height and what's the timestamp in this block? And so if you have two conflicting events in the network, um, you can look at like which one came first uh, and, and then you would know how to choose. I'm actually I'm actually curious. Like, so there there have been these computer science uh, data structures called like CRDTs, uh, conflict-free uh, data types, where essentially it's a data structure. Different people can push updates to it, and there will be eventual consistency uh, of the data without there being like an active voting-based consensus, like in proof of stake uh, proof of stake networks. So you have ways of, of getting consistency of data in a decentralized network without uh, you know, practical Byzantine fault tolerant consensus. Uh, are, are you using something like that in Ceramic uh, as well? Or, or, or are, you, are you actually getting eventual consistency via some other mechanism? Yeah, so so let's so CRDTs is, is something that uh, we're quite familiar with. We're not actually using them yet, but it's something we're intending to use uh, as we uh, improve the protocol. So right now, if we think about a single event stream, um, a single event stream is only allowed to have one canonical history, uh, kind of in the same way a blockchain has like one canonical chain. Um, and if there is a conflict, if there is a fork in this um, in this uh, event log, then we would basically choose the the fork that was anchored earliest, and this is this actually is the property that allows us to do uh, key rotation in a secure way, and and that's a whole other rabbit hole, um, w w which I have an article uh, on our blog on by the way, uh, but for many cases we don't actually need to choose one of these forks. We can actually just like do a merge and then do a CRDT based logic to uh, figure out the complete ordering of these events. Uh, so that's, that is an improvement that we're planning in the protocol. OK, so, so essentially now the way I'm imagining Ceramic is, OK, there's this huge lake of data. I can push my event stream uh, to it. And by virtue of how my event stream is designed, and the fact that ultimately this network will anchor something on the Ethereum blockchain, there's kind of going to be eventual consistency in the network where the network can agree on what events came first and what events uh, came came second. Uh, uh, roughly, that's 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 my that's my picture. Yeah, exactly. So if you have two nodes in the network and they observe the same events, they even though they might not be talking to each other. Th but they have seen the same events, they can arrive at the same conclusion. So let's talk about the nodes in the network, right? So basically, um, anyone can, what, what are the requirements for running a ceramic node? Yeah, so running a ceramic node in itself, uh, it doesn't have like super big requirements because uh, when you start a ceramic node, you don't have any data on it. And then you have to uh, tell your node that, hey, I want to subscribe to this particular event stream. And so if, if, if you're familiar with something like IPFS, where you have to like pin individual objects, 
you have to subscribe to individual event streams in Ceramic. Um, so for most users of Ceramic right now, uh, you actually, uh, or the developers that are building on Ceramic, they are running their own nodes to support their applications. Um, and, and right now in Ceramic, there's no like built-in redundance. One thing that uh, we're doing with this um, database product uh, ComposeDB that I mentioned is the ability to synchronize data between nodes so that they can have the same uh, view. Uh, for example, if you have like a blog post model, uh, we can have two different applications that build on this blog. Um, so that's like kind of uh, allowing nodes to just like subscribe to the data which they care about. Now, uh, that's fine kind of for developers, but if I'm an end user, I don't have any guarantees that like these two blog applications will be online. Um, so one thing we're, we are going to add in the future is a network incentive where you as a user or you as a developer can pay the network uh, and pay um, a set of nodes to keep this data available in the network. Uh, but right now, nodes are run mainly by uh, application developers that wants to leverage the functionality of Ceramic. You kind of, everyone kind of uh, stores their own data um, and there's no way to kind of say, I will back up someone else's data or someone else will back up my data. It's just basically all in my own Ceramic node. No, you can definitely, uh, it's, it's a public open network. So anyone mm -hmm. can subscribe to any stream in the network. Uh, so I could, for example, subscribe to, uh, to your stream and, and provide like a redundant copy of the stream. So as, as we kind of alluded to earlier, um, this is, um, for very specific types of data. It's kind of not, it's not a, um, uh, a general storage solution. Um, you kind of, we already talked about um, social networks for a bit, but what are kind of the verticals that kind of, what, 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 what kind of data usage is this geared towards? Yeah. So there's, there's around four different, uh, niches that, uh, we look at being more common today. And, uh, one of the most prominent ones right now is reputation. Uh, so we have projects like Gitcoin and Disco that are putting different kinds of verifiable credentials on Ceramic that are associated with your Ethereum address or your other blockchain address, uh, and then be able to calculate some kind of score based on that. So in, in Gitcoin's case, you have um, a civil resistance score. But we already talked about social. So there's a few different um, applications uh, building different kinds of Web3 uh, focused social networks. So Orbis is one, uh, CyberConnect is another one. Um, then another category is knowledge graphs. Um, so there we have, um, mainly projects within the decentralized science space, DSI. Uh, one of the, the most furthest along there is, is lateral. They're building, uh, essentially a knowledge graph that, uh, represents scientific discourse. And the cool thing there, of course, is like, you can look at this knowledge graph and since it's stored on ceramic, you can see who actually contributed what to this knowledge graph because it's cryptographically linked to your Ethereum address. Uh, and what they want to do eventually is, is to trickle down, um, payments to people who actually contribute valuable knowledge. Then uh, another niche, I think in the, in the ceramic community is DAO tooling. Uh, so basically if we think about the DAO ecosystem today, we use a lot of like centralized tools. We use Discord, we use uh, hosted forums that maybe like one guy on, on the DAO is hosting. And like, this seems very fragile. Uh, and um, so one example here, so, so Ceramic could be used to like replace these things with like a, a more decentralized uh, and resilient infrastructure. Uh, one place uh, where this is starting to happen in, in particular is, uh, the um, Gnosis Safe community, where uh, the Safe app has a centralized backend that just stores a bunch of transactions that are pending and maybe signed by some of the 
uh, delegates. Uh, so there's a, there's a company called DAOs and Systems. They're building a decentralized safe registry for these pending transactions on, on in Ceramic. Uh, so so those are some of the like use cases we see today. I think there's like interesting things uh, in the future that might be more speculative, but uh, around data provenance. So that could be like um, these new uh, language and image models we're seeing in AI. There's a bunch of copyright problems. Ceramic could be used to like provide attribution to who actually uh, did what and how that feed into these systems. Um, I think we want to have supply chains have more uh, attribution in their systems and similar with, with IoT. So that's things that's worth exploring in the future. Does it have to be public data by default? I mean, can I put private data on Ceramic and have it stay private or only accessible to some? Yeah, this is a great question. And uh, it's nuanced, right? So uh, by default, Ceramic is a fully public network. Uh, now, the, the first thing you might want to think about uh, when putting some data on Ceramic is, hey, I can encrypt it. Uh, so you can encrypt, certainly encrypt data, put it on Ceramic. Um, uh, and this will be private, but you have to think about the future, right? Because in the future, uh, we're going to have very fancy quantum computers uh, that might break some of our cryptography. So if you're using any kind of like current asymmetric cryptography, uh, your private data might not be so private anymore. Uh, and um, that might be, you, you might also not be like satisfied with like uh, ciphers that exist today. Uh, they might be broken, even though they're like supposed to be quantum secure. It, it really depends on like your risk and like how private this data really is. Uh, in any decentralized system uh, that is publicly verifiable, you have this problem. So the only way you can really be safe that your data is completely secure is probably to encrypt it and store it on your own machine, or you trust someone to store it for you, and then you trust that they don't get hacked and so on. It's, there's a possibility that we could explore in the future um, some kind of access control logic in Ceramic where only if you have an authorized identity or like account you're able to synchronize certain uh, subsets of data. Uh, but that's not something uh, that we really focus on right now. We think there's like a lot of exciting things in the uh, public uh, data or public but encrypted data um, ecosystem. So yeah, um, so my imagination of Ceramic is now, okay, so there's a network, there's lots of nodes on the network. I can pu publish my event stream. In the early days of the network, it's, probably nice if I publish my event stream in a way that it doesn't contain my private data or, or it rather contains data that I'm comfortable sharing with the world. Um, and there's eventual consistency in the network. So the network will agree on what came first uh, eventually. Okay, understood. So we have that basic primitive, but allude to uh, the fact that, okay, you want to allow people to build applications uh, on top where where ultimately ultimately they are interoperable with each other that's on your website so what is the meaning of interoperability for applications on top of ceramic and what might be some of the tools you have built on top to enable it yeah so so at its core like ceramic is a, an event streaming uh, protocol and this is not something that like most developers are familiar with in web two, like there are a few different event streaming solutions, but it's, it's, it's more of like a, uh, thing that, uh, experienced, uh, backend engineers used to really scale to, uh, applications to like, um, handle a lot of load. And so we need some tooling to make it actually usable and easy to use for developers. Um, and so what we created for this is compose DB. So ComposeDB is, is a graph database that allows developers to define data models, which is basically a, uh, it's a schema for your data. Uh, and this model, you can, it's, it's kind of analogous to a smart contract where, uh, where um, you, you define the data model and then users come to an application. They create 
uh, objects or documents that conform to this schema. Uh, and then the developer can query this data and, and read like, hey, here's all the objects that conform to this schema and by all these different users or query like subsets of that. And you can also have relationships between different models. So if you have a blog post, you might have a comment that points to the blog post and you will be able to query like, hey, give me all blog posts um, or like this subset of blog posts and also all the comments related to that subset of blog posts. Uh, so that's kind of the, the graph uh, aspect of that. Uh, and this tooling is built in something that's familiar with to many developers called GraphQL. So you actually define your data models in GraphQL and you query, uh, read and write the data using GraphQL as well in ComposeDB. So I understand that basically when I write data to my own data stream, I have to choose um, a data structure. Um, but how um, how is the knowledge about which data structure I'm using um, percolated in the network? Because as I understand it today, um, I, you, I, I host my own data. So how, how, is, how is the lateral connection made? So you can run uh, an indexer by spinning up your ceramic node and telling it to index and say like, hey, what are all the data models in the network? Um, or if you have some application that you really like and you would like to use like, oh, I need that data, then you can just look at if their application is open source, you can look at their uh, application code and just like pull pull in uh, the data model from there. So that, like this is the early days. I think um, what, what we're hoping to see in the future is uh, some kind of uh, explorer or catalog of data models where people can just browse the different data models, see their popularity and how much usage they have and so on. Um, and, so, and so that experience should become much easier over time. And that is also what happens if there's two competing standards for the same data model that basically you just check what gets more usage or what people uh, are more, because you kind of, there, there's a lock-in effect. I mean, if you want to be composable, um, the number of things you're compo co composable with is uh, super relevant, right? Yeah. So there might be two competing standards for like a user profile. Um, and you might want to choose the most popular one, or you might just want to have a super application that can include both profiles and just like kind of display the information that's that's best because then you have like reached to more more existing users uh, but really it's like enabling the developer community to figure out what's best for their needs so but data models are by default open source right so i can use any data model that's out there yeah exactly okay so maybe let's talk about the economics of everything a little bit um so if um, at the moment, I kind of, I, uh, I'm not actually guaranteed any redundancy. Um, is there any way to actually monetize data that I make available? Yeah. Um, so right now, uh, Ceramic is a fully peer-to-peer -peer network and anyone can spin up a node and replicate the data. Uh, so I think the the primary use case right now is not for people who want to monetize their data it's more for like hey we're a dao community we want to make sure that our pending transactions or our, our discussion governance forum doesn't disappear and then you can have like multiple individuals in this participating in this dao like providing redundancy for this data um i think monetization of data is something that's really interesting uh it's not our core focus right now uh and Ceramic is a, primarily a data network right now. I think there's a lot of interesting combinations that could be made with uh, financial uh, systems uh, like Ethereum and, and other blockchains where uh, we can leverage the best of both worlds, like maybe like NFTs and, and ERC-20 tokens for doing some of the financial aspects of, of social media or uh, knowledge graphs or, or something else, and then using ceramic for that really high throughput, uh, scalable data system. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I understand where you're coming from. I'm still kind of, I think I still have a cu couple of mental disconnects. So, um, if basically if currently 
um, people kind of replicate data, um, you know, altruistically um, and are not compensated for this. How do I protect myself against censorship? How do I protect myself against kind of having people replicate my data either incomplete um, or, you know, maliciously uh, differently than I, I, I wanted it uh, to be stored? Yeah, so you can certainly not, if, if you have your data, you're running your own ceramic node and have that data there, you can certainly not like guarantee that other nodes in the network right now can like are providing exactly the same data. Uh, but however, if there is one honest node in the network, any um, honest node that just like is wanting to synchronize data, your data would eventually be able to get up to speed and, and find all of the data that your node is providing. So as long as there's one honest node, the data will be in the network. But, but how do I decide which one the honest version is, right? So say my I, I was one of the hosters for um, my DAO community and uh, my computer went up in flames and there there's like a couple of people who kind of hosted the same content and now they're in disagreement about which the real content is. Hmm. So the only thing that these nodes can do is to remove data. Uh, and if, if your node that you know is honest disappears, yeah, then you kind of have to trust that they are providing all the data that was there before. But they can't like say that, hey, this data is in com something completely different, or uh, here's a bunch of new data. Like they, they can only say, here's all the data or like a subset of the data because all the data is signed by the end users that are participants in the DAO, and that's not really something you can fake. And so, yeah, just to be clear, like this is this is the, the, the current state of the network. We are planning to add a network incentive where either developers or communities or individuals can pay to make sure that the data is, is kept available in the network. C could you add something like um, a proof of completeness or so? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's like uh, kind of what blockchains do. Like they have this completeness because they have like this global state in, in an eventually consistent system. You can't really know if there's like some piece of data that someone's been hiding for a long time and then eventually reveals uh, because there isn't like a, a, the same completeness over time. You, you kind of have to let go of some of those guarantees to to get this more uh, scalable system. Okay, that that that's fair. So we kind of talked about um, potential ways to kind of generate revenue from streams as a user. What about ceramic? So basically, how do, how is ceramic finance or how is it going to be financed in the long run? Yeah. So as I mentioned, ceramic is a fully peer to peer network right now, where anyone can run a node. There's a few aspects that we think it makes sense to introduce uh, some kind of token model. Uh, so the, the aspect right now that is the biggest cost to the network as a whole, uh, and that Three Bucks Labs is currently subsidizing is the anchoring process. Uh, so like actually making the on-chain Ethereum transactions. Uh, that's something that uh, we, wa we uh, want to decentralize as soon as possible so that uh, it's more of like a network activity where you participating in the network, you participate also to this process of anchoring things. Um, so, so that's that's one aspect. The other aspect is uh, the availability of data. So, uh, having the ability for users to pay for their data to be available, and node providers to get paid um, by the network to just like run a node and keep some subset of the da the network of data in the network available. I think that's that's also like key to understand that like once we have this logic uh, and and system for nodes to be compensated, we're likely we we can actually have each node only needs to um, provide a subset of the network, uh, and we can have this decentralization without having the throughput limitation uh, we we have currently in blockchains. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it, it, it does answer my question. Um, so you already talked about kind of the four different niches that you feel could benefit from 
building on ceramic. Um, there's already um, a large number of uh, projects already building on ceramic. Can you talk about kind of the ceramic ecosystem and which projects you're excited about? Yeah, so I mentioned some of them already. So I think the, the largest one right now is Gitcoin, that they're building this passport functionality on top of ceramic. Uh, Disco is building uh, their data backpack system. Uh, in, in the social network niche, there's like Orbis uh, and CyberConnect. They're both building different kinds of social networks. Orbis is definitely doing a bunch of interesting things there. And they are using uh, some other um, secure multi-party compute system to actually store encrypted data on Ceramic. So that's pretty exciting. They're providing like an SDK for people to integrate comments and that kind of social functionality in in similar way that was on uh, the the previous Omen prediction market, I believe it was called, that, that we mentioned in the beginning. Uh, so what 3box.js did way back. Um, Lateral is a project in the DSI space uh, that I mentioned before. They're building these uh, scientific discourse graphs. Uh, in the DAO tooling ecosystem, I mentioned the, the safe decentralized safe registry. Um, I think I think the DAO tooling space is uh, there's a lot of uh, opportunity there uh, once people realize that this this like resilience aspect is actually rather important. And what's on the roadmap for this year? Yeah, so for this year, uh, next up is uh, the release of ComposeDB on Ceramic Mainnet. Uh, so that's something we're planning to uh, go live with at ETH Denver. So that's the end of February, early March. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what we're in the team are the most excited about right now. Beyond that, there's a bunch of improvements that we want to make in terms of developer experience and performance to the uh, ComposeDB graph database. Uh, and we're also working to make a lot of improvements on the uh, core event streaming layer. Uh, so right now, there's a t pretty tight coupling between the event streaming layer and ComposeDB. We want to decouple this so the event streaming layer is, is more uh, on its own and it essentially also enable other people to build databases or different types of microservices and so on. Uh, so those are like some of the... Um, most imminent focuses uh, over the next year. I'm trying to wrap my head around this problem that a lot of a lot of um, what ceramic is doing seems very similar to the uh, to the work done by Protocol Labs in the IPFS file coin file coin combo. So, in my imagination uh, of ceramics, if I think like ceramic versus IPFS. IPFS is similar, right? Like I can put some data into IPFS, but unless I um, run my node, unless I kind of replicate my own data, it can get deleted, but nobody can mess with the integrity of that data. That's That seems, seems very similar across Ceramic and, and IPFS. IPFS does not provide eventual consistency, so there will be no global ordering of events, but Ceramic does, so that seems to be a... Uh, a big key difference. Uh, IPFS natively did not have, uh, yeah, a lot of incentives baked into it. And Ceramic, as of today, also doesn't have incentives baked into it. But then Protocol Labs built Filecoin where um, there were incentives and people can basically be guaranteed that any data they put into IPFS will be replicated by Filecoin and made available. And Ceramic also seems to make take steps in, in that kind of direction. I'm trying to understand like what's the meaningful difference between, between these two ecosystems and why would developers prefer one of the ecosystems over the other? In this case, why would somebody prefer Ceramic over, over the other, other ecosystem? Yeah, perfect. So I, I will comment on like, what these systems do today, to my understanding, uh, at least uh, in the protocol labs ecosystem, and and what the differences are today, uh, because things 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 are likely to change in the future. So IPFS is really good if you have like static files, right? I can put a file, I get the hash or uh, what they call a CID uh, of that file, and now I can synchronize that across the network and 
uh, do a bunch of fun things with that. And I have integrity proof in this hash. Um, but there's no way to like update this file because if I update the file, you get a new hash, right? Uh, and so there's no way to have like a, an easy way to keep track of um, updates. Uh, in in ceramic, our core focus has been uh, we are, actually one important thing to know is actually ceramic is using the same data model as IPFS called IPLD, and that's how we represent this um, hash linked event log. And the the main thing we add on top of that is that we provide signa like a, a signature system, so we have attribution of like who created what, um, and and. I can I like let me go in a little bit in how that works. So essentially, uh, when you come to an application that uses ceramic, there's a session key created in your browser. You sign uh, sign in with Ethereum message with your wallet uh, that basically delegates some permissions to the session key on behalf of your Ethereum address or other blockchain address. And now uh, the user can actually use the application like they would use any Web2 application without having to like, for every like and for every comment, there's like a pop-up that we need to sign in their wallet. Like that user experience wouldn't be great. Um, so I think, yeah, that's that's like one of the key differences is that there's like focus on this, making the, the user experience of how we do attributions really well. Uh, and in IPFS, natively, you don't really have an attribution. And, and currently in Filecoin, it's really good for storing large files and large chunks of data in in a kind of backup manner, but it's not right now like something you can easily query and, and build like feature rich applications on top. And so that has been our core focus with ceramic. And so we see we see our our technology as as kind of like um, it's it's kind of taking the best of like Ethereum and IPFS and merging that to create a system that just like enables developers to uh, really build something meaningful. I also uh, compare ceramic to Orbit a little bit because this this fundamental um, idea that uh, there should be data and then there should be a lot of like people should be able to build UIs for for interoperable data. Um, this actually this value kind of repeats in many different ecosystems and Orbit is another ecosystem in which this this uh, this value repeats and essentially on on orbit the data you put on orbit is also such that many people can build different uis to it so but of course when you look at like the difference between orbit and ceramic i think like the the, the trade off space here is something like in in orbit you can push private data to orbit quite easily like it's it's designed for for privacy that's that's a strength that orbit offers along with data interoperability but then the big big challenge or weakness orbit offers on the other side is it's a completely new tech stack right from the ground up starting from operating system to networking protocol and so and to even programming language so it it's the case that the the ambition in orbit is so big that they just might end up easily outcompeted by much simpler systems that also provide application interoperability like like ceramic so that's how i tend to view that trade off what what are your thoughts on how ceramic and orbit differ from each other yeah so so i'm i'm afraid i can't make like uh, super nuanced comments here because i'm not so intimately familiar with orbit but from my, what I understand, you have your kind of own kind of virtual private server with Orbit, which you could run on your computer or someone else's computer. And that there you have the private data in, in the way which uh, we talked about earlier, where uh, yes, it's private if you host it yourself or you trust the person that hosts it, um, but you don't necessarily have like public verifiability. Uh, and, and so that's that's like a core thing that we've been focused on in Ceramic. Like, how can we have public verifiability and then add privacy features on top of that? But uh, since we're coming from like the Ethereum and blockchain space, the, the aspect of public verifiability and that neutrality that that provides has is, is been one of our kind of core principles. 
So uh, I've also seen that uh, Ceramic raised a uh, quite a big funding round in the in the recent past. So how was that funding round structured, and what what were what, what did people buy in that funding round essentially, and what kind of incentives um, does does your funding round imply for the future? I'm probably not the best person to answer this question uh, because it was led both <laughs> mainly by my co-founders. Um, uh, but yeah, what we essentially sold is equity in uh, the Three Box Labs company. And there's also uh, token warrants in uh, a potential token in the ceramic network. Cool. Fantastic. Uh, Joel. Um, so if someone wants to build on ceramic or run a ceramic node, um, where, where um, should they go to kind of find out more about documentation and speak with people who, who are already doing this? Yeah, so I think the, the main place to go for everything is ceramic.network. And uh, if, if we're specifically interested in uh, developer documentations. We have a developer portal at developers.ceramic.network. Cool. Fantastic. Thank you for coming on, Joel. This was super interesting. Yeah, thank you very much. This was uh, great fun.